I'd like to invite the first speaker of the proposition to open this debate. No, sorry, you're not audible. We're just changing our microphone. Just give me a sec. Um, okay, now now we can hear you. Sorry? No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can. Yeah. No, it's okay. So, okay. So, it is here. Not over. Okay. So, since I am audible, let me set my timer. Do you guys in the chat, please? And... I will start my speech in three, two, okay. The six decades since Africa decolonized have been filled with crippling poverty, violent and even genocidal dictatorships and sham democracies. We would rather live in a world where Africa had followed a different path. So this has prefers a world in which post-colonial African states had prioritized achieving economic land and land reparations over enshrining civil and political rights. Before the definition, Post-colonial Africa covers 52 states. This debate is not on the specific individual policies pursued in each state, but on the structural differences between pursuing economic reform or enshrining civil rights in a broad post-colonial context. This is a retrospective debate, but for the benefit of hindsight in how the situation evolved when evaluating which options should have been prioritized. Economic and land reparations are ways to transfer economic power to the masses of the country. This looks like anything from seizing land or nationalizing corporations that were held by colonial masters and distributing the land or wealth to the people all the way to programs that directly transfer cash. Enshrining civil, civil rights is, having on the, is focusing on the people's right to participate in democracy, like freedom of speech, right to vote, and right to fair trial through the constitution. Now, so three arguments from the proposition. First, how this leads to an immediate increase in prosperity. Second, how this leads to state building. And my partner will explain to you how we limit neocolonialism. So first argument on how this leads to immediate increase in prosperity. Why do economic rights matter to individuals? Firstly, day-to-day -day life improvement. If you had given these people land to their name, they would have been able to utilize this land for survival. For example, they would have been able to cultivate the land and feed their children. This matters, especially in post-colonial Africa, when during the 60s, 45% of child deaths in Africa was due to malnutrition, while at the same time, it had the biggest level of agricultural exports in the world. On the comparative, what happened under opposition was giving those people freedom of speech to ask for food without giving them the benefit immediately. Second reason why economic rights matter is independence. If you had given these people economic reparations, it would have enabled them to act independently by giving them options from ownership of land that would allow them to sell it or start trading or open up a business to cash transfer that would give them stable income and control of their future. On a principal level, we restore the auto their autonomy because they're finally recognized as people who can make choices. This is something they were deprived of by colonialists. On the comparative, opposition as a form of compensation gave these people rights they could not utilize to maximize their choices for two reasons. Firstly, lack of democratic institutions. For example, the right to vote is meaningless in a one-party state. And secondly, lack of democratic traditions. For people in power, it was difficult to understand their power is de de derived from the people. And for the people, this meant accepting the complexity of democracy, like being on the losing side of elections and having to accept majority, lose, the majority control. This is complex for them to understand. So third reason why economic rights matter to individual is trust in the system. Because the outcome of having day-to-day -day improvements and independence is that these people would have started to see immediate change and tangibly benefits to their lives. 
on the comparative when rights didn't give them immediate benefits, they ended up being by the system that didn't give them what's promised in the chat fields. So economic um, so economic rights are the first priority. Why immediately after decolonization is a narrow window in time for the opportunity to get these rights? Two reasons. First, the momentum of decolonization. When decolonization happened, there was a distribution of political power. So with new institutions in the way, it would have made sense for a distribution of economic power to have been part of that process as well. On the comparative, what happened under opposition by postponing land reparations was establishing a new state that reflected the older colonial economic order. So when South Africa is now doing it during and is not doing it during the colonization, but now it's target now it's targeting part of the elite instead. So initially it said it would happen in five years land reparations, but now the target has changed to 35 years later. So the second reason why now is the right time to do the, why after the colonization is the right time to do this is that elites were at their weakest because the right because right after the, after the colonization they had part of economic wealth but they didn't yet have the opportunity to establish their control over the new government. So opposition allowed the elites to establish political power without challenging economic power. So pursuing economic reparations to start would have meant less powerful elite to oppose this process. So, for example, Ghana, that prioritized political reform and only tried cross transfer programs 10 years after independence, at which point elites had established political power and could make sure to get the majority of funds. Well, in that case, it would have been much easier to have a successful cash transfer program immediately when elites, when elites power was not so much a trench in society. Now, moving on to the second argument about state building. Why are economic rights and reparations likely to create a more stable state than civil and political rights? Uh, before that, that argument, I will accept the POI. You keep talking about how you will be achieving all these great impacts for vulnerable people in the post-colonial states, but you never explain to us how you're going to be doing these things. How is the land going to be distributed and by whom? Who is going to be deciding who gets the cash in that colonial state? Who is going to be leading order, those? Order. Okay, so, well, there are land reparations have a, a, a defined process of happening. You have the new state that has been assigned the role of distributing the land to the people as fairly as possible. And since under ours, we make it a priority, then all political capital, all the focus would be on how to give these cash transfer programs, how to distribute land to the weakest, to the most vulnerable. These things would be the criteria for starting this. And in fact, this was in our model from the get-go about how this looks like nationalizing companies, for example, to distribute wealth to the masses. Now, moving on to my second argument about state building. Why economic rights are likely to create more stable states than civil and political rights? Because to have stability in a system, you need to have people buying and support. So when politicians promise that, that people's lives will become better, and actually they don't, the system loses its credibility. So what happened is people were expecting to change improvements in their day-to-day -day life, but when the promise of meaningful rights never materialized, they lost faith in the system. On the comparative, if you had given these people a piece of land, the system wouldn't have been perfect, but they would at least have tangible improvement. Why is it important? Firstly, this led to uprisings by the people who were disappointed by the system, to which political leaders responded with martial law and violent oppression. For example, in Congo, Mobutu had 300,000 civilians. In that instance, people neither had economic prosperity, nor did they enjoy the rights they were promised to get. Secondly, when things go wrong, people needed someone to blame, and because there were societies that were deeply ethnically divided, they started blaming each other, leading to incredibly bloody civil wars and even genocides. For example, in Rwanda, Tutsis controlled a lot more land than the Hutus, and this fact that the fact that it was never redistributed led to conflict which escalated to genocide. On the comparative, when you have a small business, you don't want economic activity to be interrupted by conflict. So there is less chance of this happening. So why are we likely to create more accountability because we, it's, because we decrease the asymmetry of power between people and the government? This is important because colonialism created ethnic divisions with local elites that benefited from their regimes because not just the colonial masses that pressured the people. For example, in Rwanda, Belgium chose the Tutsis to rule over the Hutus, and now we increase accountabilities from the two Hutus to the Tutsis because now, because we give them land, they can actually have an influence in government because they're the ones that pay taxation and contribute to the state budget. So even if you buy the idea of democracy is better, you, you think the democracy is good, on the other side, you have more accountability. So for more accountability and better state building, we're ready to vote.
I'd like to thank the first speaker of the proposition for their speech. And assuming the panel is ready, I would like to invite the first speaker of the opposition. Uh, am I clear and audible? You are both. Okay. So, um, three, two, one. There is a reason why the majority of post-colonial African states did not prioritize economic and land reparations over enshrining civil and political rights. We Moroccans know this truth way too well. Subject to decades of dehumanization, the most important thing was for these nations to give their citizens their autonomy back. We stand for a pragmatic approach that would not have wasted limited political capital on controversial and polarizing economic redistribution when those nations are already fragile enough. Today, I will do four things in my speech. First of all, I will outline our, our stance for this debate. Second, I will rebut the opposition's case. Third, I will present my first argument about the importance of civil and political rights. And fourth, I will present my second argument about the practicalities of economic and land reparations. So let's start with my st our, our team's stance. Our stance in this debate is very simple. We prefer a world that largely resembles the current status quo one where the majority of post-colonial African states prioritized enshrining civil and political rights, such as rights to protest, vote, free speech, and forming associations over achieving economic and land reparations, such as active land redistribution, quotas, and cash transfers. That is not to say we think that those things are bad, but with limited political capital, we believe our side is both more important and more pragmatic. When we talk about prioritize, we mean governments, civil society groups, and local populations doing this through governments, charities, or any other vehicle for change. Now, let's move on to the rebuttal. First rebuttal, you spoke about economic land reparations, means saving land, nationalizing corporations, and distributing the land. First of all, who will decide who gets the land? How is that distributed and by whom? Without elections and without a proper democratic process, it is very likely for there to be unequal distribution to happen. First of all, due to corrupt leaders that take control and the other, all the other issues that occur in these post-colonial post states without actual proper governments. The people need to have the right to vote, plus civil rights, in order, order to organize themselves in, a group, in groups and voice their opinions on this and be able to have proper discourse and have an actual say in how that land is distributed. And B, after colonization, states are very unstable and very vulnerable to corruption. The prop tells you, in response to our POI, that they will have land distribution. But land distribution can only be successful it's the only case where it's successful is in a structured state with uh, structured stable work union or election or some kind of political system that is only developed through political rights on our side of the house. So our side of the house actually does more for land distribution over long term than their side does uh, later on. Secondly, economic rights. I spoke about the day-to-day -day life improvement. The biggest issue is that these guys give you the impact of economic rights, but never explain to you how these impacts are achieved. How are these economic rights going to be given? Third, the right to vote is meaningless, they said. Well, we tell you that's exactly the opposite. Without voting, without having civil rights, people remain dehumanized and unheard. Vulnerable minorities like women and children will not have their voices heard on their side. How do you guarantee people will be given the land they need? You simply cannot without a proper political system. Fourth, you speak about state building. The promise of meaningful rights never materializes. People are given lands. You never give a reason why meaningful rights will never materialize on our side of this, uh, our side of the debate. Why will civil rights not be promised? You also never give the likelihood to which economic rights could be achieved. I'm intuitively that led to understand your impacts, but I do not believe that they are likely to happen because you never explain why land is more achievable to give to people than civil rights. Now let's move on to the first argument. Let's speak about the importance of civil and political rights in these societies. There are a few reasons why we believe that civil and political rights were the most important thing for African states to prioritize in their post-colonial periods. I'll be answering this in three different points. First of all, this is what citizens in, in colonial periods were most denied. Many colonial rulers, uh, be it British, French, Spanish, or whoever, often operated in these countries by a certain control without any limited or democratic input from citizens. Where citizens had a say, it was often limited to the most elite or those who supported the colonial regime. This was done in order to, for those colonial forces to maintain their power. However, this denied the majority of citizens their fundamental autonomy, the thing they craved the most, their capacity to vote for their representation, their capacity to simply express their political opinion, and as a result, this was the most important thing to take back after that colonial period is over. Of course, people care about their economic status too. We don't say that they don't. However, there is a reason why middle-class citizens agitate for change in dictatorships or one-party states. 
they desire the fundamental human dignity that comes with being able to express your free will in society and political system. Secondly, these rights are necessary for some of the most vulnerable groups. Women, sexual minorities, and ethnic minorities often face massive discrimination in post-colonial societies, often as a relic imposed from conservative Western rulers. Civil and political mechanisms were often the only way these groups could bring attention to their struggles, whether it be through free speech, protests, or otherwise. Three, these rights were crucial to prevent democratic backslide in post-colonial states. For many African nations, the post-colonial period represented their first attempts for decades or centuries at self-governance. Whilst many nations thrived, many nations faced challenges to the democratic cronyism. Only strong political rights provided a mechanism to check this democratic backlash and ensure fragile institutions do not completely crumble. Uh, before I move on to my second argument, I'll take your POI now. If leaders are corrupt enough not to be able to do land redistribution, why wouldn't, for the example, rig the election, making any right to vote completely meaningless? Well, simply, I'll give you the example of Morocco. Morocco focused on land redistribution after colonial states, where the people in power were the elite in the society. They took all the land for themselves and did redistribute it properly. However, on our side of the debate, political rights are the first thing looked at. Therefore, the people elected are through the consensus and the votes of all the people around them, not simply by being elite or being a general in society. Therefore, they have their structured people that were put in place by their people, that were chosen by their people, and to have a much, much higher chance of being less corrupt due to being in a politically correct system. Now let's move on to argument number two. We speak about the practicalities of economic and land reparations. Even if you don't believe my previous arguments, we think that for to a large extent, post-colonial African states should prioritize pragmatism. And there are many reasons why economic and land reparations are far less practical than civil and political rights. I'll be answering this in two points. First of all, in many cases, it will be simply be downright impossible to achieve economic and land reparations. I'll be expanding about this in four different points. First of all, land reparations is probably the worst case for opposition. Take, for example, the case of South Africa. Given the significant overlap between post-colonialism and apartheid, advocating for any land redistribution is a way from white land owners would not only have been unsuccessful due to the massive influence of white land owners such as farmers, but this might have been a very real chance of inciting significantly further, significant further violence as individuals felt their very livelihoods were threatened. B, taking even a less contentious example, even quotas or cash transfers in the majority of African societies would have been seen as contentious due to the perceived nature of them taking from one group and giving to another. C, this is not the case with civil and political rights, which are not zero sum, which is exactly what they're proposing. That is, if you give rights to one group, you don't need to take it away from another group. Whereas that is necessarily the case with any form of economic distribution, which of course leads to conflicts and tension in the country, which is especially bad for these fragile the new countries that are still developing. D, the conclusion of this is that governments and civil society groups would have not only wasted their limited political capital, but may have actively risked further destabilization and violence in many fragile societies. And that is their only impact. Second of all, secondly, in the long term, we think that it's actually easier to achieve economic rights through stable political rights. For example, when you're able to freely form associations like unions, you can advocate for worker protection. When you're able to freely vote for a party that represents your actual interests, you can vote for the best economic policies. And Prop's world is one where, at best, we'd have achieved some economic redistribution, but not prioritize a long-term mechanism to continue to achieve economic benefits once those needs evolve in the future. Only our side does so. And that's why I'm extremely pr proud to support today. Thank you. Thanks to the first speaker of the opposition. And now we continue with the second speaker of the government side. Um, you're not audible. Uh, 
Am I audible now? Yep, now you are. Thank you. Under our side of the house, we have more people immediately and right now being fed. We might not be able at their, at their scenario to say that someone's child is being hungry, but what we can do is feed that child because these people are more likely to have land to cultivate, to sell their crops and to be able to have a normal life because we're talking about two very bad situations. But we think that what is better off is for these people to be able to have these, this well-being. Because the reason why, we, why democracy would care about society is for the well-being. And we think that the end goal of both sides should be the well-being of the African people. Before going on into my argument about limiting neocolonialism rebuttal, four main things. Firstly, opposition is telling us that we are going to have unequal distributions because of corrupt leaders, but that people need to group and have a say and decide together where there are not these land reparations are going to happen. Firstly, we think that the same people that are going to have these civil rights and give them to the people under their side of the house, we're talking about the same people that are going to do this land distribution under our side of the house. Because these are the people that are more likely to assume power. The people that are leading the independence movements are the ones that usually are elected in the beginning of these democracies because these are the most known people. And in the same way, they would usually assume power under our side of the house as well. So if these people are so corrupt, then that is also the way that they corrupt these democracies that they're able to then change the constitutions. So, but what do we change here is the second response. Having these same people under our side of the house, we have more accountability for these people exactly because the, the, the states are now more dependent on the people, care more about the people because they have something to offer, right? Because now that these people have land, now that these people are paying taxes, they're not just a burden to the state asking for shelter and food, but they're actually something that the state is dependent on. On the comparative, it is very easy to like dismiss their civil and, and, and political rights when they can just say that these people are not as important because we don't get our money from these people. Let's change the constitution. It's much harder to have accountability when the state is not dependent on them. But thirdly, even if you buy that under our side of the house, we have more corruption, right? We stay get the benefits of having at least some kind of land distribution, at least some kind of more cash towards these people. So on the immediate level, these people are better off because they're less hungry, because they're able to use their money to invest in things, because they're able to have autonomy in their decisions. But secondly, because we have more stability in that place in general, exactly because of the fact that they're not leading to have conflicts, that we have less, we, we, oh, we even told you about why genocide is less likely to happen because of this stability, which is very important. So even if you buy that corruption, we still think that it is very important to have these economic reparations prioritized. But secondly, opposition is telling us that people lose their voices. But we think that, as I said in my introduction, it's not as important for people to lose their voices when we're talking about people that do not have like basic things to begin with. We think that these people need to have these reparations, need to have this land, and need to be able to like have to have this immediate benefits right now. But thirdly, opposition is telling us that the reason why they want civil rights is because this is what people were mostly denied because they did not have a say like during colonialism, which we think to an extent is true, right? Like during colonialism, former colonial powers did not give people the ability to have a say and to have political liberties. But the reason why this was harmful is because they also didn't give them a way to take control of their resources, to take like to be able to decide what is going to happen with their land, which is taking away the, the, the idea that these people have ownership over their land. When they didn't let them decide what to do with their minds, what to do with their agriculture, this meant that these people now don't feel like their land is theirs. 
So in order to be able to have civil and political rights, even in the long term, if you buy that this is something ideal, we need these people to feel like what they're deciding on is something that is theirs. And this will not happen if you don't give them the ownership, right? Because the ownership is what they have been missing for all of these years of colonialism. But fourthly, opposition says that land redistribution are unsuccessful because they're pretentious because they come from one group to another. We think that firstly, it is harmful that the examples that they gave us are of things like South Africa, which have been delayed and delayed again and again, exactly because they let time pass, which now makes it harder to do this redistribution because it seems like you're taking away this from the elites and not from the colonial powers. But secondly, we think that this is exactly why land distributions cannot happen later on, and we need to prioritize them in the beginning, because this is when we have more turmoil going on in society. This is when we have a general thing of like changing the way that society exists, and generally of trying to make reparations, taking stuff away from the colonial powers, especially when we have when we live in a society where a lot of decolonization happened in the same time period. Before moving on into my argument, I'll take the point. Okay, so no point. Now, my argument is about limiting neocolonialism. This argument is going to prove that prioritizing economic reparations is necessary to limit the influence of the former colonial power. Even 60 years after decolonization, colonial powers are still benefiting from the extraction economies that they created, which is why France is dominating Cameroon's agriculture and selling in their own markets. This means that even though decolonization ended formal political control, it did not end economic control, since a lot of the assets remained in the harm of the former colonial power or their local collaborators. How does economic presence enable other forms of neocolonial influence in the area? Firstly, political influence. Having economic influence over the country like France owning the majority of Senegal's banking, telecommunications, and supermarket industries means that they get more bargaining power and intervention in the political situation. Because when a majority of the African state's income comes through these taxes, when they're all, especially when their own people are that poor, this means that if they see a benefit in cheap working hands for extraction, they're more likely to pressure for the continuation of such conditions. But secondly, they can even have military influence because they can use the excuse of, I have my assets there, I need to be able to defend them, like France does with having troops in Mali, Chad, and Niger. This is important because these two ways of influence break the self-determination and sovereignty of these African states. How would prioritizing land reparations and cash transfers fix this? Because returning wealth and capital from the colonial elites to the masses means that they would have the ability to use this capital to create domestic industries. Therefore, they could use their minds to build manufacturing rather than only extraction. This could create an economy that is more independent from the former colonial control. Notice that by doing this from the beginning, like it would become easier to actually disengage from that economy versus on the comparative, because you have tied your development to these companies that extract, it's not easy to happen. And when we're creating this independent economy, this means that when the other powers like the US and China want to have influences in China, in Africa, which they will because of the vast resources, they don't get involved with the extraction model, but they're more likely to have agreements as trading partners, which would be better because they're established based on a new order as two sovereign states, so they're more likely to be actually beneficial. But secondly, because the agreements will be beneficial to the majority of the people and not the top 1%, because they are the ones that own the assets that now foreign powers want to use. So because we prove to you that it is actually better to have economic independence with our side of the house, please vote for pro. Thank you. I would like to thank the second speaker of the proposition. And now we are ready to continue with the second speaker of the opposition. Thank you very much. Am I audible and visible? Okay, I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. If history has shown us anything, it's that humans value a sense of autonomy and dignity above all else. Revolutionaries, soldiers in war, mothers foregoing for their kids, all have given up economic security in the name of freedom. The continent I call home was brutalized and dehumanized for decades by foreign rulers who thought that they knew what was best, but they didn't. 
Only citizens of these nations know what's in their interest and only political and civil rights can give them that. I will do four things in my speech. Firstly, I will rebut the opposition's case. Secondly, I will present my first argument about international exploitation. I'll present my second argument about the risk of corruption and I'll do some weighing. So firstly, let me respond to what the second, the second proposition speaker has said. They kept telling you that on their side, they have the most short-term benefit of having people being immediately fed. But we've already explained to you, panel, that these these impacts don't make any sense without a proper mechanism. They still don't explain to you how land distribution, how cash quotas, how all of these economic reparations will actually happen on their side. How will this land be distributed? Who will be making these decisions? Who will have their cash removed in order to give it to someone else? All of this model, this model is not existent on the, on the proposition side. They haven't explained to you the detailed outline of what is needed in order for their economic impacts to have any sense. We also tell you, no, thank you. Protected time. We also tell you that the comparative is that it is very difficult to hand out political and civil rights in a discriminatory way. For example, if you protect the right to protest, you are almost always likely to do this for all groups in society. And this is the point that they have not responded to. We already told them that there is a great point of contention and tension because of their economic policies, because at the end of the day, if you're giving land to someone, you're taking it from someone else. And that creates tension in an already unstable country that has just been decolonized. And for you to not respond to these arguments makes you already lose that clash. They also tell you that, you know, the same people will have power on both sides of the house. And we completely disagree with this point because we tell you that people that are likely to receive power on the proposition side without an electoral process are people who already have power, who are not the vulnerable stakeholders of this debate, who like women and children and minorities, ethnic minorities, sexual minorities, who do not have the ability to choose for themselves the leader that they think will represent them best. We tell you that through our side, with an electoral process, we have the ability to choose a leader that will do the best. So we tell you that on, the, on the point of tangible changes, our side can support basic welfare programs that help the most vulnerable. But proposition has to specifically defend things like active land distribution, quotas, cash transfer programs, which are not necessary to get people out of poverty. Proposition still has to explain how they can achieve those things. We explain to you why those aims would have been impossible in many countries in our first, prop in our first opposition speaker due to the fact that they are seen as a trade off for some groups, which is not the case for political rights. And even if economic rights are important, they are not more important than political rights, because the only way that you can achieve any form of utility is by being able to express your preferences in a political system, which only our size provides. And at the end of the day, we provide the longest term pathway to propositions benefits. With only proper political rights, can groups form unions, lobby governments for economic policies, and so on. So I'll be moving Moving on to my first argument about the international exploitation. The premise of this argument is simple. Even as, no, thank you. Even as many colonial forces exited African states, many did so with unease, either believing their ousting was illegitimate or seeking to continue to reap the economic rewards of colonial exploitation. Thus, these powers looked for other ways to exert power or control, for example, through exploitative trade deals, resource projects, and so on. Our claim is that that would have been significantly easier for colonial powers to do this if African states did not prioritize political and civil rights in this period. Firstly, political and civil rights simply provide a mechanism to lobby domestic governments if citizens feel that international powers are exerting inappropriate influence. For example, to vote out a government that is in bed with a problematic Western company. Secondly, international powers can more easily justify intervening in African states when they perceive them to be quote unquote broken or corrupt. This is likely, this is less likely on our side when these states have a much healthier political system. The second a proposition speaker told you that on their side, they'll have better trading relationships with countries like the US, countries like France, and that they'll be better partners. But we tell you that the reality is when you have a broken political system, these higher powers like the US and France can take advantage of that country and can exploit them further through exploitative trade deals. The impact of this argument is clear. We get less long-term international meddling in African states, allowing them to be more autonomous and not stuck in an exploitative relationship that is different to their past colonial rule. Moving on to my second argument, but before I do so, I'll take your POI. When these countries like France have so much 
have so much investment in these colonial states, why would the government kick them out when it gets a lot of the money from their taxes? Okay, international investment is based on so many factors. It's based on resources, it's based on borders. It is hard to fully predict that if investment, that investment would have been stronger if those countries' economies would have been stronger. If I take your best case saying that your economic impacts will happen. And as we've shown you, powerful Western countries may have further exploited African countries post-colonialism if they perceive them to be weak politically. Like with the example of South Africa, for example, when that political system was weak, African state uh, that African state was subject to exploitative trade agreements through apartheid policies, for example. So when you have a, a weak political system, there is guarantee that you will be exploited by those same trading partners that you reap that you claim you reap benefits from. Our second argument about is about the risk of corruption. To be perfectly clear, we are not saying that all post-colonial African states were corrupt. However, we think economic distribution in certain states may have been susceptible to corruption or lobbying influence, especially where government government institutions were more fragile. This looks like groups with more political power, such as farmers, lobbying governments for, for a greater slice of the pie, or in the worst case scenario, corrupt officials embezzling parts of cash transfer programs. This has a few impacts. Firstly, proposition just reduces the benefits of their economic redistribution because they keep telling you about how they're going to have this, you know, poor, vulnerable child being fed on their side when we tell you that it is very likely for that child to remain starving on their side. And secondly, if exposed, this is likely to exasperate tensions within a country and pit certain groups against one another. And thirdly, this is likely to undermine faith in governments, which is crucial for new democracies if they feel their officials cannot be trusted. The comparative, as we told you before, is that it is very difficult to hand out political and civil rights in a discriminatory way. For example, if you protect the rights to protest, you are almost always going to be doing this for all groups in a society. The economic distribution that the proposition proposes to you, panel, has to, is contention on the fact that someone will be losing land and another person will be gaining land, that some people will be gaining more land than other people. And that already creates tension in a society, even if they claim that will be done in an equitable way, which they haven't provided a mechanism for why that would happen in an equitable way. And even in the case that it doesn't happen in an equitable way, all the economic impacts that they've outlined in today's debate about helping people be better um, taxpayers, helping people be you know, active citizens in an economy, all that impact goes straight away and does not happen because they don't have the they don't have a foundation for which those impacts will happen. And for all these reasons, I proudly, proudly, proudly oppose this motion. Thank you. Thanks to the second speaker of the opposition. And now it's the time for the third speeches. I'd like to invite the proposition third speaker. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry, am I all the blue? Great. Uh, I will be receiving the eyes from the chat as well. So I'm just writing on. Nice. Opposition has been changing the description about how corrupt the states are throughout the debate. At the beginning, they're telling us they're so corrupt that land distribution will not be able to happen. And then they bring a second speech argument, which you have a system working so great that you're literally able to outvote politicians you don't agree. To clear this debate, this debate is about a world in which you have the same leader. The question is whether this leader with the same corruption is better balanced and checked and whether the people are better off in a world that you have, would have prioritized land distributions, you would have prioritized economic rights. This means that opposition cannot be changing the characterization of what this corruption looks like every time it is convenient for their case. But second clarification here, they've been pushing us this burden of our impacts do not materialize because we never explain how this distribution will be done. The same actor that is giving the political rights to their side is giving the economic rights to ours, right? If the government is doing the distribution, 
like it, the, the distribution, this happens under our side. The way the sound distribution is going to be done is case by case scenario, obviously, by focusing on what all people having a piece of land, having cash transfer programs, depending on the size of this country, and obviously how this is managed by the establishment. This is something that, like the same actor that this would have done under their side of the house, right? But now into my classes. Firstly, about the benefits to the people, and secondly, about stability. Look, in the first class, their main contention to our entire case is that land distribution will fail because of corruption, and hence our impacts are all, as they claim, thrown out of the window. And to that, we have two very important responses. Firstly, we have pointed throughout the debate that corruption is symmetric, that if they are, like, if under their side of the house, politicians are corrupt, like if under our side of the house, politicians are corrupt, this means that also under their side of the house, the same politician is corrupt. The reason why your side is better is because, for example, if you're corrupt enough to make land distribution a little bit different, you will end up having a piece of land. Yes, maybe not the same with the elites, but you will have a piece of land. Under your side of the house, if you end up corrupting the election and it's rigged, then for your like right to vote is meaningless because whatever it happened, the very electorate process was corrupt. Under our side of the house, you at least get some benefits. But secondly, and most importantly here, let's take them at their very best and assume that somehow under our side of the house, we have more corruption. Here's why more corruption still wins in the debate. Because even if they're more corrupt under our side of the house and they give less rights, like they give a lot less land to the people, right? They're giving them very, very little land or very, very little cash. We told you why even a very, very small piece of land is important to literally feed your, feed your child to the point that during the 60s, malnutrition was the cause of 45% of children dying in Africa. Under your side of the house, yes, you have, for example, less corrupt freedom of expression. Now you're able to have a more independent press. But what's the point of that if the reason why you needed it in the first place was to demand the food that we're immediately giving them under our side of the house? This is why at the end of the day, even if we take them at the best, what they never manage to respond is our argument about why these people, what they need in the short term is the ability to eat, is the ability to exercise the basic economic rights, that they were deprived of, and in reality, this resulted to deaths of children, deaths of family that do not have access to a simple necessities as food. But also, notice that they bring the response of South Africa, right? And they tell us no, because in South Africa, the cash transfers did not work, which is exactly their problem, right? And South Africa is an example from proposition. The reason why cash transfer programs failed were because they were too late, they were postponed, and then the elites had too much power, which are, was our mechanism about why this should be prioritized, and they never managed to respond. This means that all our ideas about why this is something that you should be prioritizing now now, because it's the perfect timing, because elites have the less power than we we'll ever have still standing in the debate, and there are enough for us to win it, because it means that under opposition, these people never end up getting these economic rights that are fundamental to their survival. The second thing that they bring in this class is that civil rights empower people the most because that is what they were most denied during colonialism. And to that, we have two different responses. Firstly, we think they're being a lot assertive here. We think that the major harm that was done during colonialism is that these people were not able to exercise the right of property, that in Nigeria, they were not able to take control of their oils, that in Congo, they were not able to take control of their diamonds. Not having a right to property means that you're not able to understand that you have a right towards the state, meaning that even if you give these people the right to vote, these people don't have the sense of empowerment, don't have the sense that I am have a right towards this property and this brings me this empowerment that I need. You're giving these people a right to vote in a world in which they don't even have like rights to property. But secondly, do we also tell you that under their side of the house, civil rights do not end up materializing? This is because as we told you from the get-go, which they didn't respond to, you're giving them, for example, the right to vote in a way that the institutions themselves are not being established. This means that, the, that in their best case scenario, these things end up materializing in the very long term, taking away all the benefits that they bring you about faith in the system. Because to the point that decolonization has happened, and the first thing that you prioritize is this right, but the institutions are not there, these people do not see them as valuable. And in the long term, this results to them not being able to exercise them. And this is why like a lot of states right now in Africa do not have a democracy, exactly because these people were not able to take advantage of these rights.
But thirdly, they also tell us that rights are very important to minorities. Yes, we also think that for these minorities, what is really important is for them to eat, is to have food, and also who are these minorities and the women that are so great and like they have gotten all these rights, we think that they have been massively oppressed to the point that they did not have basic access to necessities and therefore if they were locked we were placed in a lot more difficult positions, being forced in extreme conditions of work and hence being deprived of even more rights. Before I move on to my class about stability, I'll take the point. So you say that the vulnerable stakeholders on your side will be better benefited, but you never explain to us why these vulnerable stakeholders are likely to reap the benefits on your side, given our analysis yes. on power and corruption. Great. No, you need to stop telling us that we don't have mechanisms when all of our case was about how we needed benefits to the majority of people result to them having food, right? It was there. If you don't want to respond to that's another issue, but the mechanism was there. Now into my class about stability and tax. The first thing that you tell us is that pensions are going to be greater because you take land by from, by other people. Firstly, that's not true. We're taking the land from the colonial elites and we're distributing it to the people. But secondly, if that's your metric of how tensions arise, we think that it happens far worse under their side of the house. Because under their side of the house, the moment you want to do this land distribution is the moment which a lot of time from the colonial era has passed, which in the end of the day results to some elites owning the land. And this is when the like tensions are most likely to increase. And this is when their description of how you're getting land from other people is actually materializing. But thirdly, we're also telling you that you are likely to have less conflict because the point that these people have a land, they also have an economic incentive not for conflict to exist because now their property is at stake. But fourthly, here, we are also telling you that you're likely to have less tensions and to hold the government better accountable because to the point that these people are given rights, that they're contributing to the GDP, that now they're an important stakeholder of taxation, what happens is that they're better able to hold the government in check, right? The same government that now depends on these people to literally be economically prosperous or to profit from their land. For all of these reasons, because you wake up in a better world under our side of the house, for the majority of people where they're able to literally feed their children, vote for proposition. I'd like to thank the third speaker of the proposition and for the last constructive speech of the round, I'd like to invite the third speaker of the opposition. Um, I would like my POIs to be taken verbally, and I will start my speech in three, two, one. Can you build a house with unstable grounds? The answer to this question is rhetorical and easy to answer. However, why does it feel to you more tricky when it gets to attain economic growth while having an unstable society? It's pretty much the same case, but with different words. The answer that seemed obvious to the first question is likely to be the answer for the second one. We can't attain economic emancipation while our citizens are still protesting to get their rights. A European country that once were the ones who colonized African countries come now and tell us that what we did was wrong, that our entire strategy was wrong, giving, giving up our political rights and drawing towards money was the right strategy to do. They come now to tell us to tell us that we did it all wrong and that we should have chosen the other way. But we all know this is just a way to tell themselves clear the conscience that they, they are not the reason we haven't developed our country. To convince us that we are the mistake, not that we have been colonized for more than 20 years, the humanized, and the moment we were set free, we wanted to get our dignity back rather than our land, which shows dignity over anything, because we knew that without our political rights, we will be exploited again and again and again by these countries. And now they are coming here telling us, you shouldn't have taken this route. You should, you, you, you chose the wrong route. This is why you aren't developing. Clear they can see their conscience, maybe. So before I, I begin, I want to start by saying that the third prop speaker has completely ignored our second our second uh, speaker argument about international uh, exploitation and our analysis on corruption they are not engaging in this debate in any way so let me so let me start with some rebuttals first let's agree upon that uh, upon, uh, upon one thing that t prop haven't provided any mechanism about how this land reparation and cash transfer is going to happen by who how any no criteria were, uh, were given no mechanism nothing just talking in the air and by this the, their motion falls we already have we have already explained to you that this impact don't make sense without a mechanism they still have not explained to you how this land will be distributed who will be Making this decision, who will have their cash removed and given to someone else, etc. So two main clashes in this debate. So the first main clash is going to be about corruption, and the other one is going to be how they are keep uh, stating how vulnerable uh, stakeholders are going to be benefited while no uh, 
clear mechanism about how they will reap in the benefits they are they are they are they are supposing so our first clash is about corruption they claim that corruption exists in both sides this is not true we tell you that economic distribution in certain states may have been successful to corruption or lobbying influence especially where government institutions were more fragile this looks like group with polit more political uh, power such as formal lobbying governments for a greater uh, slice of the pie or in the worst case scenario corrupts official embezzling parts of cash transfer these uh, uh, the comparative is is that is that uh, is very difficult to hand out political and civil rights in a discriminatory way for example if you protect the right to protest you are most likely to do this for all groups in society they have clearly clearly and in real comparison they keep comparing corruption on our side and corruption on their side embezzling some money doesn't have anything to do with corrupting an entire election this is not sympathetic at all well you corruption on your side is most likely to happen because they are corrupting taking land to have, having more cash and etc but you are saying that it's the same as corrupting an entire election well it doesn't make any sense they say that in their world they have independence and citizens restore their autonomy do you think in a world where they don't have right to vote to speak to choose for themselves it's being independent having the land but no right to vote is exactly the opposite of independence their most our second main flash and their most oh, important yes. arguments uh, later their our second clash and their most important argument was that post-colonial uh, states suffered from extreme poverty and uh, 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 and that in their world they have more people to be fed and we have four responses to this uh, although these claims are too vague and not true in in all cases as they, as they imagine most people in post-colonial countries are all uh, uh, are all uh, not fed well four responses to this is our side can support basic welfare program that help the most vulnerable prop side has to be specifically uh, has to specifically defend things like active land distribution quotas and cash transfer programs which are not necessarily to get people out of poverty second prop still has to explain how they achieve those things we explain to you why those aims would have been impossible in many countries due to the fact that they are seen as trade up for some groups, which is not the case for political rights. Thirdly, even if economic rights are important, they are not important, more important than, than uh, political rights. The only way you can access any form of utility is by being able to express your preferences in the political system, which only our side provide. And lastly, we provide we provide the longest term, uh, the longest term pathway to profs benefits only with our political Political rights can group from unions, lobby governments for economic policies, and so on. Now I will take your POI. What happened is that these people were giving a right to vote in the hope that they would manage to elect someone that will bring them food instead of literally giving them the right of property to cultivate and have food for themselves. Well, you are you are talking too vague because you are because what I'm hearing is that these people, yeah, they are they are voting for people to protect them, to uh, to give them money to eat, to give to feed them, and we are not saying that all politicians aren't achieving that. Well, we are saying that by this right, not just to vote, the right to express themselves and so on, they are the right, they are protecting themselves and elected politicians that are going to be able to develop the country. Well, later on, they are going to be able to also have more money and so on. Uh, so they say the right to vote is meaningless and it's not important. Well, we tell you that's the exact opposite. Without voting, without having civil rights, people will remain dehumanized and unheard. Vulnerable minorities like women and children will not have their voice heard on their side. How do you guarantee people will be given the land they need? Well, much better to choose who can do that than than wait for someone who didn't choose to do that for you like as, uh, as you said like people are choosing the person they want them to they want uh, they want them to uh, to uh, to represent them well in your side they haven't even 
elected someone who is going to be a uh, redistribution land. And as we are saying, you have provided no mechanism of who is going to, is, is this person who is going to be redistribution uh, redistribution land is going to be elected by the population or is it going to be chosen by the elites who are going to be benefiting them more than benefiting the, uh, the, the, uh, the, entire, the entire country? Well, they are having economic influence in, they have, they said that having economic influence uh, will influence countries such as France. Are we going to have economic influence right after the colonial period by having land reparation? Is this your solution? Don't you think this, this would just happen in the best theoretical word you are providing? Well, most more international investment will have been better with stronger economies. That's what we are going to say. Well, we have three responses to this. International investment is based on so many factors, resources, borders, etc. It's hard to fully predict if this investment would have been stronger. Second, as we, as, you, as we show you, powerful Western countries may have further exploited African countries for post-colonialism if they perceive them to be weak politically. We have... We, we say that if when you have a broken political system, powerful countries would just take advantage of it and exploit it rather than help it. And for all these reasons, we proudly oppose. Thanks to the third speaker of the opposition, and now the reply speeches. I'd like to call upon the opposition reply speaker. Okay, um, am I audible and visible? Okay, I'll begin my speech in three, two, one. And every single one of proposition speakers, they keep telling you about this vulnerable child that will be fed on their side. They keep mentioning this child and what their future will look like on their side. Well, I would just like to take a moment to actually paint to you, panel, the reality of what that what will happen to that child on, in propositions world. Let's take it into the context of Morocco. So the French have left the continent. They're finally able to, you know, be free and independent of French colonial rule. What actually happens? Rich families families in Morocco take control of the land and take control of that land distribution that they keep telling you about, about those cash quotas, those cash transfers. Moroccan families that are vulnerable, that are poor, that live in poverty, have no right to vote, no self-autonomy, no suffrage, no ability to express their frustration through lobbying the government. They have no bargaining power, no ability to speak for themselves. And at the end of the day, that vulnerable child that they keep telling you about will not be fed and will not have the right to speak for themselves themselves because they don't have the right to vote. They keep telling you that, oh, well, we're also going to have corruption on our side, but we tell you that it's much better to choose and elect your leaders for yourself rather than wait for a more powerful stakeholder to do that for you because there is no guarantee that they'll actually protect your interests. So I'm going to be responding to the main clashes in this debate and then I'll be doing some weighing. Firstly, on the clash of the likelihood of economic distribution being successful. They tell you that economic land reparations will be successful on their side, that they're going to save land, they're going to nationalize corporations, distribute the land, they're going to give people economic rights and help them on a day-to-day -day basis, give them the ability to be taxpayers and to be citizens that contribute to an active economy. But we tell you that in many cases, all of these impacts are very, very unlikely to happen and that it's downright impossible to successfully achieve economic and land reparations. We told you that land reparations are sometimes the worst case for many African states because many quotas or cash transfers can, can be seen as contentious because of the perceived nature of them taking from one group and giving to another. We also tell you that this is not the case for civil and political rights because they're not zero sum. Because when you give voting rights to one group, you're not taking away the voting rights of another group, whereas it's necessarily the case with any form of economic redistribution. And we also tell you that in the long term, we think it's actually easier to achieve economic rights through stable political rights. For example, when you're able to freely form associations like unions, you can advocate for worker protections. When you're able to freely vote for a party that represents your interests, you can vote for the best economic policies. Propositions world is one where at best we'd achieve some economic redistribution, but not prioritize a long-term mechanism to continue achieving economic benefits once those needs evolve in the future. I think the biggest thing that proposition has not done in this debate has actually to characterize to you panel what their economic economic policies look like? What does it look like to have a cash transfer program? What does it look like to have land redistribution? They don't do that on their side. And we tell you that only through unions, only through political systems, strong, stable ones, can we have those economic policies 
in the long term. Now I'm going to be doing some weighing. Our arguments in this debate are the most important because firstly, we help ensure the most prosperous long term future for these nations. Only political rights can help governments in check and ensure that they do not backslide dem democratically, which would undo all the gains made in getting rid of these colonial rulers. Secondly, we tell you that we help protect the most vulnerable. While low income individuals are indeed the most vulnerable, so many other groups are only protected by our side of the debate when they have the capacity to bring attention to the struggles that they are experiencing in the political system. We also tell you that we ensure the most political and economic rights on our, on our side. That is, proposition side cannot meaningfully achieve political rights, but our, but our side can achieve economic rights in the long term once we have institutions in place to sustainably do so. And finally, we prioritize what the majority of citizens are likely to value the most, which is a political system that helps them feel dignified and no longer dehumanized. And for all these reasons, I proudly stand for opposition. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now for the final speech and debate, I'd like to call upon the proposition reply speaker. Am I audible? Thank you. So. Under opposition, people have freedom of speech without an independent press. Under opposition, people in Kenya have the right to vote, but they have a one-party election. Under opposition, women might, ha might have the right to protest, but their children are starving. Even in the best case of opposition, that they have less corruption, but they still have these ethnic tensions that we keep telling you from the beginning. They still have all of this unequal inequality in the land, in power, in economics. They even have like cases of conflict and genocide. When the very reason behind the genocide in Rwanda was the land, as we told you, was the fact that the Hutus had more land, that the Tutsis had more land than the Hutus during colonial rule, and land was never redistributed, we're telling you that in this world we wanted to have prioritized economic and land reparations. Two clashes in the reply: firstly about stability, and secondly about corruption. Starting with stability, notice that this is an independent clash and an independent benefit of the land given. This doesn't mean this, and this doesn't need for us to have a lot of land for each person, but rather the fact that they now have some type of ownership. We have told you three main things. Firstly, about pensions, that we're less likely to have pensions when you have some ownership, so you're less likely to have these deadly conflicts that we're telling you. But secondly, we're less likely to have these ethnic divisions that are deepened under opposition, as we told you, that have even led to genocide. These mechanisms were not responded, but what we heard from opposition is that you can have conflict from land redistribution because you're taking away someone's land and taking it to the other. This is why we told you about why this is important for it to happen in the beginning, where we are in a context of the changing situation, where we're changing like regimes, when we're changing the international arena, especially when this decolonization happened around the same decade. This is why it needed to be prioritized in the beginning. And from their first, opposition has said that they would want land distribution at some point. They just think it should come from the people. If they agree that it should come at some point, because of this reason, that we told you it is only going to work if it happens prioritized in the beginning secondly in this clash we told you about how it is harder to take away these like ownership exactly because it's more tangible versus on the comparative it's much easier to change ballot stuff to like even restrict a bit of freedom of press because it takes more time for you to realize this and why because of this it means that it's more easy for our types of rights to actually succeed on happening this wasn't responded so it means that we are more likely to have this benefit which brings us to the impact of having less tensions and not having more people being able to feed themselves. But thirdly, on neocolonialism, they're saying that we don't respond when we had an entire argument on this that they did that they only partly responded to. And when we brought back in the POI our mechanism on why governments are less likely to listen to the people when they have these colonial powers 
having all of this economic rights and control and why this would change when you actually redistribute this economic control from the beginning and allow the people and the masses to have these rights to be able to make more decisions on their account. So the impact of this clash is that we have more stability, which allows for more economic development that is independent of former colonial powers. And because of this clash alone, we can win this debate. But in the second class about corruption, opposition says that people are corrupt, so they don't give good distribution, so we don't get any of our benefits. But firstly, we have told you again and again on why corruption still exists under their side of the house, but even they can have worse harm, right? Because when Mugabe is changing the constitution to actually distort like economic uh, civil rights and be able to have a dictatorship, when Kenyatta, the elected president, prohibits rivals from running, this doesn't allow for their rights to actually live at all. Whereas for us, if that means that they're limiting and giving less land to people, at least they get some land, at least they're able to be fed even a little. So we also told you why they're more likely to be contained because of this accountability that was unresponded. So this also helps us win this debate because even if we have more corruption, at least under us, it's less likely to affect the people. For all of this, please vote for PROP. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Proposition Reply Speaker. And I'd like to thank everyone for a great debate. Um, uh, I would now like to invite my panel to move to debate um what is it prop prep room 10 and we will confer there fill in our ballots and then we'll be back in a while thank, thank you, guys you for, for the, the debate, debate. Thank thank you. You. Good debate. Good debate.